Go ahead whenever you can. This is Daniel New, the father of Army Specialist Michael New. We're going to be talking here in a few minutes about the, the uh, implications of wearing a foreign uniform or wearing a United Nations uniform, so don't go away. Stay tuned. This is Daniel New, the father of Army Specialist Michael New, who refused to wear the United Nations uniform. We hope you'll stay tuned for the Freedom Report coming up next. I love Mike Hansen archives. Did you ready to write? Keep watching the classic videos right here on Hansen Archives, Waco Archives, and the original station, Mike Hansen Archives. I just wanted to show you those videos and these videos still have to be uploaded. Uh, that's what's taking so long. We have hired somebody to do it and we do have the equipment to do it now. So, and believe it or not, this and that is just over here at one of our offices and the, all the rest of it, we have at least 10 times this uh, over at the uh, museum. So uh, we are busy doing it. And uh, if you would like to uh, participate uh, in helping with that, uh, we're gonna throw an address up there. She's gonna throw the address up there right now. So uh, we would appreciate that. And uh, to help the cost of that, we are uh, offering my book at $25. Uh, we'll sign it and send it back to you. Uh, give us a call at 830-672-3083. Uh, and uh, we'll, we can take your credit card and put it on the credit card if you want to do it that way. If not, you can send us a letter at uh, 901 St. Joseph Street in Gonzales, Texas, 78629. All right, be sure to go to our new channel, Waco Archives, with all the great interviews we've done over the last 27 years. Thanks a lot, and God bless. This is Steve Lane again reporting for The Tie That Binds and The Freedom Report, and I have the distinct pleasure tonight. We're at the Silver Eagle Tap House for the Gulf War veterans that's being put on. It's a fundraiser being put on by Captain Joyce Riley telling the truth about Gulf War illness. And we ran into Daniel New, father of Michael New, who uh, be, uh, brought himself some fame by refusing to wear uh, UN uniform, UN insignia on his uniform. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. New. Thank you very much. Uh, tell us tonight uh, why you came tonight and, and, and then after that uh, a little bit about what happened to Michael. Well, there are, there are a few uh, organizations that have been as supportive as uh, the American Gulf War Veterans Association in terms of supporting Michael and we support their issue. We think that the uh, what was done to our Gulf War veterans is it was a, a travesty and what Joyce Riley is doing is a very important message to get out to uh, guys who are sick and who are being told by the uh, by the Veterans Administration or by the medical doctors that it's in their head but they're dying from it and uh, uh, they're dying from this disease that, that they tell them is in their head and so we think it's a very important issue and uh, one that affects uh, lots of veterans because what, what's, what's at stake there is an issue basically of having been lied to by our own government and yeah. so that's why we support Joyce and uh, Captain Riley and and her husband and uh, and and Dave early on in his in, in when we even before we knew about Joyce or had just heard about her back in uh, early 96 I guess the uh, maybe late 95. He interviewed me on his radio station in Waterbury, Connecticut. He had a little talk show up I there. I remember that. And, uh, and when he did, uh, he then, the next day or two, he was thinking about Michael and he, he, he was working at, at, on a carpentry job and he kept thinking about this little phrase going through his head, a patch of green in a sea of blue. And he was seeing Michael, he was just watching my, and this thing turned into a song, which he's written, and he sang it tonight. I don't know I if you heard it. Were it was excellent. It was very excellent. And that's a good song, and uh, maybe you guys can get a cut of that to, uh, to put on your program. It, definitely. Tell us, uh, for those of viewers who might be watching who don't know what happened to Michael, can you give us a little background, not just on what he did and how he stood up for his country, but what were the results of, of him making that stand? Sure, and, and I should say for those who don't know about the issue that, that basically he was an American soldier, he was working, he was serving in Germany, a medic, and he was told that uh, 
uh, if he didn't wear the United Nations uniform, the helmet and the patch and so on, that he would be put in prison or that he would be court-martialed. And he said, look, guys, I, I'm an American. You know, I don't understand what the problem here is. He said, I took a, an oath to the United States of America. I did not take an oath to the United Nations. I will go anywhere in an American uniform under American officers. Even if I don't like the mission, that's not the issue. You can't put me under a general from Finland it's against the Constitution. You can't force me to wear an unauthorized uniform. So they did court-martial him when he disobeyed the order. He, there's no question he disobeyed the order. The Army would not allow the evidence of why he disobeyed it to be presented to the, to the jury. So, of course, they found him guilty. And uh, as a result, we're appealing that. Now, we've asked the, the, the civilian courts to intervene. We've gone to federal district court, and they said, we won't look at it until the Army is through with him. We, went to the, we appealed that. We lost. We went to the Supreme Court. We lost there on the right to be heard in the civilian courts. We've now lost the court-martial, so that's four times. Now we're now waiting on the decision of the of the Army Court of Criminal Appeals, which was held on May 28th this year in Washington, at Falls Church, Virginia. We expect them to rule against us, but we don't understand why it takes over three months to decide no. I mean, you know, they could have done this in 30 minutes, you know, over coffee and uh, just gotten it over with. They didn't even record. They didn't record uh, orally, they didn't have a stenographer to record that, that, that hearing. And so these judges can't look back later and say, what did we say, what was the argument? It's just all memory. So clearly they didn't take it serious and, they, and they're not going to uh, they're not going to do anything but turn us down, but they're stalling for time. Now I haven't had the opportunity to meet Michael. I've had a, read a couple of mainstream news clips. Tell me, my understanding of it is, is before all this happened, I mean, we're not talking about a person that's that has disrespect for authority, are we? We're talking about a person who has always just towed the line and been just straight and narrow. And, and I'm not going to say this is, I'm not going to call this out of the ordinary f for him, but y you would definitely say that, you know, he is not a person that shucks authority. Is that oh, correct? Absolutely not. Absolutely. This, he, Michael was a model soldier. He was offered a, what they call a green to gold program, which is where an enlisted man moves to a uh, an officer's uh, program. Oh, that is not, I could tell you, I was in the Air Force. Yeah, That's not an easy thing to get. They asked him if he would be interested in that and he said, well, you know, guys, look, I'm from East Texas where they have trees. You sent me to West Texas where they don't, you know. Can I, can I, can I see the world? You know, he's at Fort Bliss out there in El Paso. And uh, so then they sent him to uh, Saudi Arabia after at the follow-up to uh, Desert Storm. And he said, uh, yeah, it's a lot like West Texas with that with camels, you know, and, and uh, so can I see some more of the world? And so then they sent him to Germany, and uh, and it was just a matter of time. He had already been promoted early. He was promoted earlier than he was supposed to, which you, you understand how they can do that with sure. a, a sergeant and an officer signing off mm -hmm. on it. And uh, he was in line for sergeant's promotion, but had to wait for time. Uh, he was a, a good soldier, and uh, he had saved several lives on maneuvers, and uh, uh, he loved it. And uh, you'll, you'll appreciate this. He, would, he said once to me that, he said, I get up every morning and I say, I could do 20 years of this standing on my head. I love this life, you know. And then he'd go to bed every night and he would say, I'm going AWOL in the morning, you know. <laughs> you know you know how you have this love-hate yeah. thing that goes on all, all the time. All too well. But, but he's a good, he was a good soldier and uh, he was seriously considering a career. And I think what he's proved now is... Now you were just talking about how much Michael loved what he was doing. Uh, obviously, this couldn't have been an easy decision for him to make. Can you talk a little bit about what motivated this decision? Why is this... Uh, I know why it would be important to me to not wear that insignia. Why was it important to him to not wear that insignia? You know, a lot of people have, have wondered if he agonized over it, and it was it was an instinctive thing. He said, uh, uh, he called me up, and he said, you know, Dad, they've asked me. He said, I think I'm going to be court-martialed. And I said, what, what have you done? <laughs> that must be <laughs> sure. I was going to say, in light of what you just told me, that, that had yeah. to be a pretty shocking. Yeah. I mean, I thought, what on earth have you done? I was already thinking. It was an accident. I mean, you know, <laughs> you're making up excuses for your son. He said, well, I haven't done anything. And I said, all right, then why would they, they court-martial you? And he said, well, uh, uh, it's for something I'm going to not do. And I said, and what on earth is that? And he said, well, they've told me I have to wear this blue helmet. And I said, well, and we understood immediately, you know, what, what the implications were. But he said, you know, it seems to me, Dad, that, that, that first of all, I took the oath to my country, an exclusive oath, and I don't see how they can force me to shift my allegiance to a foreign power which the United Nations is. By law and by treaty definition, it's a, un it's a foreign power. And he said, if they can force me to wear that hat in Europe, well, then what's to keep them from forcing me to wear it in Texas someday? I mean, you know, geography is Good no point. defense. You can't say, well, sure, Sarge, you have the authority to, get to make me do it there, but not here. So the question, it, it's a matter of time. And, and I think the day will come when we will see blue helmets in America 
uh, enforcing the new world order. Oh, that's good. I was going to say I get uh, I get upwards of 45 to 50 emails a day, and I have gotten a lot of emails recently about. Uh, alleged UN troop movements. I haven't been able to go and follow up on them. It's something I'd like to do, but already we're seeing some forces, at least it's being alleged, uh, doing exercises in different areas of the country. We know that there have been uh, Russian soldiers and, 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 and uh, uh, a number of, of Eastern Bloc soldiers at Fort Polk, at Fort Riley in Kansas, Fort Polk in Louisiana, and others, uh, and, and we have first-hand reports of that uh, for the last three years. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have come to me with, with first-hand evidence of, of foreign troops in, in the country. Now, we're not just talking cross-training of, of an officer as a corps or elite. I know the Air Force trains pilots who are going to be flying right. our planes, that sort of thing. At Fort Bliss, they do that with 200 Germans and 200 Japanese. Every There is a continual rotation. But uh, uh, that's growing. Uh, I think the day is coming, though, when, when we're going to see. You know, we've just got a new international criminal court that's been put into exactly. power. And uh, I've been maintaining that it's like a three-legged stool. They need three, th in order to have one world government, they've got to have three things that they don't have now. One, they've got to have a world taxation system to pay for it so that they can quit begging the United States for money. Once the, I mean, once they have their own source of funding. I think they call that the EU. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, the, you know, the, the Rubin tax that's the, the, been proposed, not the Rubin tax, Tobin tax has been proposed, mm -hmm. uh, a dollar a barrel on every, a, a dollar a barrel of tax on every barrel that comes out of the ocean floor, um, a dollar on every, uh, or one percent of every international flight, uh, one percent on every international financial transaction, that's a lot of money. That is a lot of You're money. You're talking independence now. Then they don't have to beg for their money. It's no more Mr. Nice Guy when we quit paying the bills and they have the independent funding. So they've got to have their world tax. They have to have a world court to enforce those tax orders and to enforce uh, United Nations law, quote, and they have to have an army. They have to have a world army. Okay, well they're trying to do that with them in the military. The International Criminal Court is being placed into position and the tax is proposed. The things are there. I've got a United Nations publication on my desk at my, in my office uh, put out by UNESCO in which uh, a guy by the name of Visas who is from uh, Spain says that uh, one of the proposals that, that UNESCO is making is that all military bases, all military bases will be turned over to the United Nations. Mm. Well, when you see that Al Gore has signed away all of our, our, our not all, but many of our national parks, through, through treaty organiz uh, through treaty agreements, so that even though we get to pay the taxes and we get to pick up the garbage and pave the roads, they get to make the decisions where people go, what animals are introduced. The the large policy decisions are made by the United Nations at Smoky Mountain National Park, at the Grand Canyon, etc. Including where the Liberty Bell is housed, exactly. also. Exactly, World Heritage Site. These things are are alarming developments, and they're all headed towards one world government. Anyone who thinks or who says that they're not headed to a one world government is an ignoramus. They have not studied the issues. Now, now I, just out of curiosity, is this something, are these issues that you were aware of before all this happened or maybe just slightly aware of and now you've become more informed? Or How did that timeline uh, go about as far as uh, with Michael making his stand? I'm ashamed to tell you that Michael was not as informed about the United Nations as he could have been and should have been for his age and I take the blame for that because as a parent and in a homeschooling atmosphere I should have taught him more about the United Nations. I don't but, know, I'd say for him to make a stand, the kind of stand that he did yeah, though, I mean that's point. still pretty impressive. But I mean, you know, his sergeant asked him who's the, who's the general, uh, Secretary General of the United Nations and he didn't know. Mm. Uh, you know, there are gaps in every, every child's education and homeschoolers are the same way. But yes, I was aware of these things because my father taught them to me and I was in the process of teaching them to my kids. But we focused, we were working overseas in a missionary capacity and we tended to focus more on the positive aspects of what it is to be an American. We also tried to teach our children to think for themselves. Uh, you put those two factors together, you know, probably that's all you need to do, you know, teach them to How think. dangerous, ask yeah. questions, Very think dangerous. on your own, teach them yeah. the Bible, <laughs> teach them the, the documents of the Founding Fathers, and I have a, I wrote a letter to my dad, and I'd forgotten about it, but he gave me a copy, he gave me the letter the other day, He's, and I'd forgotten writing it, but there it is in my own handwriting in, from the Philippines, and I had said, here's Michael, who was uh, 12 at the time, and he had asked me uh, to teach him more about the Declaration and uh, the Constitution and all that stuff, you know. So, I mean, clearly we were working on that education and he had a, a hunger to understand about freedom and, and, and the concepts of freedom. So I guess what we really did was we focused more on a foundational thing, but he didn't have his facts. He had to do a lot of research to be able to to uh, uh, contend in the, in the thing. And 
to finish answering your question, I have certainly learned a lot since then. I mean, people have sent us books by the by the uh, fifty pounds. I it's got to be overwhelming. Oh man, I tell you, it's become a, it's a it's a full time job to open the mail and to. Uh, and, 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 to, and to, I can't even begin to read all the books that people send us and the videos, and uh, which is it's a wonderful thing, and yet I feel inadequate to to be able to respond to it. But it's been such a spontaneous outpouring all over the. Country. I was going to say I can't even imagine what you go through. I mean, I'm in a relatively small city in Austin. Like I said, I get about 45, 50 emails mm -hmm. a day, and and I feel so guilty that you can't <laughs> respond to every single one in the way that you want. Mm -hmm. And and so what you go through, I mean, I can't even comprehend. Well, if you don't work for a living. You can you have more time to do that? Well, that's true too. I'm still working very hard, so that makes it difficult. That we were just saying that if we could figure out a way to do this to make money, we would well, really be onto something. But you you have got to be intensely proud. I mean, for your son to make that type of stand, I mean, you're talking about. I mean, David and Goliath doesn't even begin to describe I it, and it's not something that was easy yeah. for him either. Yeah. You know, it's funny. He says it wasn't that difficult uh, to me. I think that at that age, I could have made the same decision, would have made the same decision, and could have told it. See, the colonel offered him a, a um, what they call an Article 15, you know, just a slap is. on the wrist. You know, it's like a, uh, yeah, it's like a speeding ticket. You yeah. get an Article 15. He, he'd probably have to work uh, extra duty, like I said, eight hours days, exactly. 12 hour days for, say, 30 days. Yeah, exactly. And uh, he said, uh, and and, the, and he said the colonel could tell that he was going to say, nah, I know, I don't want it. I'll take the court. But he had to do it. He said, all right, look, it's Friday. Wait till Monday. You know, think about it. You know. <laughs> so Monday morning at 0900, he goes back in, and and uh, he says, well, have you thought about it, son? And he says, uh, yes, sir. I'll take the I'll take the court martial, sir. Now I could have said that, but I don't think I could have done what he did next. He went out and ate lunch and held it down. You know, I mean, I would have been really uptight having to go to the colonel and say, no, no, you know, I'll take that. And like, like you said, loving it so much. I mean, yeah. you, there, there, I don't care what anybody says. There has to be a certain amount of feelings. I, I'm, I hate to use the word betrayal, but it, it's got to tear. I, I mean, you say it was easy, but it, it would have to tear at me. Well, yes. At the same time, there's a. I guess of, of all the factors that I've got in my, uh, in both Gabriel and Michael that I see very strongly, is that when they see that clearly it's right and wrong, it doesn't matter where yeah. it, it doesn't matter where it falls. If it's right, point. it's right. You know, if it's wrong, and it's and, wrong. and I'm sure they've towed the line publicly. But have you been able to speak to some of these officers and some of the people that surrounded Michael uh, privately? What they've said about it, what their reaction to it was? Oh, so many officers, uh, active duty personnel from all branches have come to us. Uh, uh, Michael would be stopped on base and uh, a major on one occasion stopped and he says are you specialist new and he thought yeah. can you not read a uniform sir <laughs> but he, he said yes sir and uh, he says hang in there buddy you know or you're, you're standing for all and of it, us. but and, and on the one hand that's got to be rewarding but on the other hand I mean especially as a father you got to wonder these are the leaders these these majors forward. these yeah. colonels yeah, why can't they yeah. come out publicly and back this kid exactly. it'd be a totally different story if that exactly. happened so I think what we've proved, if nothing else, is that one, they were right. Michael was officer material, you know. And exactly. Two, and two, they're not interested in officer material. Exactly. I've got to tell you, my experiences in the Air Force were the reasons I got out was the lack of leadership. When my dad was in, he told me it, it was a situation where colonels, majors, captains, they would stand up for their troop, and it, that troop was their responsibility. If that troop got in trouble, they'd say, no, you let me handle it. He's right, my troop. Right. And they would handle it personally. And what I saw when I was in at least one small base in the Air Force in Abilene, Texas, it was uh, put the blame on somebody else. Cover your butt, you know. Cover your tail and advance your career and don't and don't rock the boat. Mm -hmm. and, th and that is, it's That's a disturbing really trend. Everybody talks about how we, and we may have very well have the greatest military in all the land, but what I, I saw so many of the flaws that it's at times it's very difficult for me to believe that. I'm sure that every military has always had flaws, but I, I, I it's, it's sad, and yet there are really and truly there are a lot of very patriotic officers, uh, uh, and yet like Michael said, you know, look, these guys have got a career, they've got a wife, Families. they've got children, they're they're five years from a, from retirement, you know. So that's asking a lot because they've seen what happens when you go up against the system. They choose you up and spit you out and you lose it. My experiences were majors and above were good guys because they came from from uh, from a, um, a, a generation mm -hmm. that leadership meant something, integrity and honor and duty and things like that. But it seems like below the majors, that's where the cutoff was, at least in my experience. Yeah, and it's and it's moved up. I talked to Colonel Ray, who was you know was uh, the Marine Corps Colonel, who was our first attorney and uh, was also a Deputy Assistant Secretary of, Def of Defense, a Vietnam veteran, combat veteran. 
and uh, he said it's really that's it's deteriorated to a higher point now. I mean, you're talking about it's gone up into the ranks of colonels and uh, and the uh, and the you know, and the, the uh, commander in chief as well. Well, <laughs> let's let's keep this a family show. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what we can do to help Michael, mm -hmm. uh, and also what because uh, we get calls all the time. What can we do? What can we do? What sure. do you think people can do to help put an end to this new world order? Well, obviously, people have got to wake up to the threat. I mean, that's the beginning of any fight is to wake up to the threat. And I think one of the finest tools that we've got is the uh, is the video about Michael. I've heard so many people say that really opened my eyes. A guy tonight here said, man, until I heard about, when I heard about, I never thought about it. When I heard about Michael's situation, it, it all clicked immediately. He said, I instinctively understood he was right. We've got to tell active duty personnel what they're being asked to do and help them to learn to say no to the new world order. The video is a good tool to do that, and I'll get you the address. And, and, uh, oh, and uh, you're welcome to. Uh, we'd be happy to share it, and we'll give people a good price. It's twenty dollars as a fundraiser to pay the lawyers, but we're not in this to get rich, you know. You mean you don't try and manipulate and say it's 1995 so that they think they're getting a great deal? Well, <laughs> it's a it's a contribution to a defense fund, right. and, and and clearly. Uh, it's free for a gift of twenty dollars. Don't you love that? Right. <laughs> this is what the lawyers tell you. you got to say that. No, I understand. But um, uh, if if somebody's active duty or they're going to get it to a veteran and they don't have twenty dollars, tell them to get hold of us anyway. We'll be happy to share it. We we'll, can help them out yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, we'll help because we're 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 trying to get it to get the word out. There is legislation pending. It's awfully late this year, and I don't think it'll pa it'll pass. But there is a bill, uh, a resolution, HCR one fifty eight, which would make it against the law. Well, it just says that Congress believes that it's against the law to force Americans to wear a foreign uniform, including the United Nations uniform specifically, and uh, only has ten sponsors. It's amazing, you know. And a That's couple, horrible. A couple of them are Democrats, and, and three or four are Democrats, and uh, so it's a bipartisan bill introduced by Helen Chenoweth from Idaho, and uh, we've got a couple of Texans on there, but it's. Uh, I, I would suspect Ron Paul's sponsored that as well. Ron Paul was one of the yeah. original <laughs> co-sponsors, <laughs> as well as uh, Ralph Hall, a Democrat out Probably of. Probably uh, Bob Barr too. Uh, Bob suspect. Barr's not on that list really? yet, but needs to be. You know, yeah. He definitely needs to be. His letter was the first letter to the Pentagon asking, what's the deal? Bob Barr's was? Mm -hmm. and, no, and they didn't never heard of Michael Newton, the Pentagon, of course. <laughs> and uh, so he said, what's the deal? You know, this was, I mean, almost immediately. And it happened so spontaneously, I sent a friend uh, an email, um, actually uh, on a little bulletin board, mm -hmm. and said, I got this problem, and, you know, what am I going to do? My son's about to be court-martialed for serving. Man, the ne I came back to my email about two days later, and I have 300 messages, you know. And oh, it just, man. boom, he put it on the Internet instead of instead of responding privately. Sure. And, uh, and congressmen were getting bombarded without us mounting any kind of a campaign. There was a spontaneous response all over the country. And almost most adults know this story. I'm not talking teenagers, but most adults know this story. They don't get it from their mainstream newspapers, radio, and television. You know, they get it from listening to, from digging. They listen to alternative or to smaller shows like this one. They listen to, to shortwave or they, 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 they look for it. They dig on the internet. You know, they can get it. And then people send faxes, word of mouth. Uh, but it's an educational campaign, you know, and uh, but people have to understand that it's the, basically we're talking here about the end of the republic. If we can force Americans to serve a foreign power, then we're not a free country. No, that's exactly right. It's called loss of sovereignty. It's loss of sovereignty. And national sovereignty is the enemy. And if you love your country, then the United Nations is your enemy, whether you like it or not, because you, they have declared war on everybody. Who that's right. Them. They don't recognize boundary. Their, their boundary is itself the, the world, world. The globe. That's their, that's their turf. So uh, uh, this is not a war we asked for. It's a war that's being imposed upon us, and we have an administration who is on the side of the international. It's embracing it. They really are embracing yeah. it. I think that's an impeachable defense. I and and the, the, the really sad part is, is the people that are putting this forward, they have no love of country whatsoever. These are people that have... Uh, more owe more allegiance to their bloodlines and where the money is at than than any nationality and th and that's that's really sad thing I, I've seen that a lot yeah and in many cases it's even more scary their their commitment is to humanity or to the planet or to some of these or to some some Marxist concept of it takes a village to raise a child I mean, yeah. you know, <laughs> That's eloquent Marxist uh, dialogue, uh, dialectic stuff. I mean, and you, know. you see, too, uh, it, it was illustrated very well in a, in a book uh, recently published by Tony Brown, uh, where it talks about 
uh, these many of these people feel like they are a chosen few meant to well, lead the masses. I mean, yes. And, and it's, this, they believe it. Yeah, it's right. not like this is just some thing somebody right. made up. They really, you know, if you could corner them in a room, they'd say, yes, I'm much more, sure. I'm much better to lead yeah. this world than, than anybody else. Absolutely. And, and, and it doesn't bother them because they are Darwinians, because they are, are atheists. Excellent there point. is no... There's, there's no moral premise that would that would prevent them from killing off a large percentage of the population. Exactly. And if you, if you follow the United Nations uh, treaties on, on world population, you understand that, that is, there is such a cry. And maybe you guys have covered it, you know, yeah. but they would like to eliminate about 75% of us. No, they, they, they would they would absolutely love it. I'm being conservative with that figure. And uh, it wouldn't bother but them. But that would be the middle class. It's not going to be the lower working class because they need workers to make all their goods. Of course. And they've got somebody to sustain them in the uh, lifestyle to which they That's a very, I'm so, <laughs> it's well, just mean, nice to, to have a, uh, uh, they've got to have the peon class, but uh, I mean, this sounds like something out of a, a science fiction movie. It, it, really, it really does. does. I, I tell people all the time, there. Uh, this is a horrible analogy, but, and I'm embarrassed to say that I saw it, but I saw a movie years ago, and I'm not going to say who was in it, but he had these <laughs> special glasses where he could see that there was aliens all around us, and you could only see them if you had these glasses on, and he was going crazy because nobody else could see him. And to use an old analogy, it's the emperor's new clothes. He's naked. No, he's got a beautiful robe on. No, really, he's naked. It, it's, it's hard sometimes. Yeah, we need to develop, devise some glasses and sell them to people. Yeah, and <laughs> that's basically, say. that's what it comes down to. It's, it's the educational thing. We've got to... It's his own defense. You've just got to educate one or two or three people in your family. If you know someone who's in, in uniform or who's thinking about in enlisting, you know, get to them. Make more of this. Look at this thing. I heard from a Marine recorder, a re recruiter in uh, California that the number one question he hears these days from his recruits, Marines, I mean, you know, these guys are not famous for being rocket scientists. You know, these are kids to start with, and second, they're Marines. I mean, think about it. <laughs> and they're saying, if I sign that document, Sergeant, does that mean I have to serve in the United Nations? I mean, really? that are their parents are asking that question all the time. That's fantastic. The question is getting asked. It's reaching. And, and I think it's level. important to note too is that I've heard some people say, well, I'm not going to get, I'm going to get out or I'm not going to sign up. No, mm -hmm. I want them in mm -hmm. and having that knowledge. Sure. I want them to be a part of the military sure. and have the knowledge in the new world order sure. so they can be the ones that are saying, hey, this is wrong because if they're not in, then we are going to have a huge army just lined up for the UN. I've just made all the Marines mad at me. <laughs> My dad was a Marine in World War II, and uh, I was going to join the Marines, but it was Vietnam, so I... T tell them Semper Fi, and you'll make up for it. Yeah, Semper Fi, man. I, my, my act of cowardice was to join the Navy, because it was Vietnam, you know. And, well, listen, and, when we have more time, I, I want to, uh, we'll have to do an interview with you to, to have you tell us about what's going on out in Arizona, and we'll put you in touch okay. with uh, Mr. Sure. Alex Jones, who, who's an FM radio host, and he'd love to have you talk about Happy that. I do it any time. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks great. for the Thanks time. God bless. Come up here. All right, that's it. All right, well, who wants a later? Let's Jeans go. Go ahead. Yes, sir. All right. God bless.